original story was actually going to be an army of NGUs versus an army of Unisols, and that was in the early drafts of the script. Once we came to this location here, Creamy Copsy, this uh, steel factory, to scout, we started to see what an unbelievable location it was. Suddenly it seemed much more interesting to create a single antagonist that could stalk his victims in this house of horrors type of location. We went through two or three or four ideas before we really came up with this idea of Chernobyl. It was plausible and was kind of a twist on the headlines and Jean-Claude was aboard and had lots of ideas and of course Dolph has lots of ideas so it was a lengthy process and, and finding the right director was important too. For a story like this it wasn't necessarily to create a very complex narrative. I almost narrowed the scope of it and narrowed the number of characters so that it would be much more of a suspense film rather than simply just a action extravaganza. We can recognize the character of Luc de Vreux close to the first one. And that's why I was very attracted by the script and the ending will be 25 minutes of non-stop action which is very unusual and it's hard. I'm shooting with uh, real champions so those uh, kicks and punch and this and that physically it's kind of hard you know. Hey, I want to be very humble but it's like a phenomena with my legs and my body because I go to the gym the face look like 40 pass the body is still like very strong and I've got that optimism. And since the push of JCVD and the beautiful critics from Time Magazine, it gave me a new B12 shot to do action movies. I worked with Jean-Claude 18 years ago. Seems like only yesterday almost. <laughs> It's nice to work with somebody who you haven't worked with for that long and also brings back memories of the first picture. I'm glad we're still both in the business and still both in pretty good shape and we can beat each other up again. So I'm, I'm enjoying it. I've been given the dubious task of trying to express what all of these poor Universal Soldiers feel. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> no, you cannot. You often contemplate the complexity of life. It's sort of like the old Frankenstein myth. People always feel sorry for the monster. There's something tragic about the fact that they've been controlled. Action! MMA fighter Andre Arlovsky, my number one choice for that character once we came up with him because I did a documentary about the MMA world some years ago. I'd seen him before and seen him fight. I've been fighting almost for 10 years. I fought almost eight years for UFC. Now I signed a contract with Affliction and uh, Golden Boy. What Andre represents uh, in the fight world and the kind of fighter he is and the kind of personality he is just seemed to fit perfectly with what is essentially the ultimate badass. I did one movie in the U.S. and I, I was in a couple movies in Russia, but this is uh, so far it's the biggest role and biggest like action for me. Yeah. This guy, he must be very attracted to the film because he lost his hair. He's always with hair, and he has a bear like a werewolf, and. I think he's more handsome this way. And look what I do to him. Look, look at his face and look what he do to me. <laughs> Nothing. Not That's to game, show yeah. you the superiority. Jean-Claude Van Damme, he was my hero when I was a kid, you know, and, uh, and uh, I have a lot of posters of them in my room. And right now it's like you can say that dreams come true, you know, and uh, I fought against him yesterday. It's kind of says that he gonna kill me today, but... <laughs> He's a great presence on screen. He has a great instinct for how to behave with the camera, how to kind of present his own physicality and his own image. He seems to have an understanding of that. It's a different technique for the movie, you know. You have to show your punch. It's, it's supposed to be like more flashy in the boxing. It's the shortest and the quickest punch is the best punch. So 
in the beginning it was kind of difficult for me, but right now I feel pretty good. And Charlie, he gave me some advice. He, he told me, forget about everything what you did here, because in a real fight it doesn't help and it doesn't work. Andre, he's terrific. The only thing he hasn't done is we had him fall 80 feet, and not that he wouldn't do it, but I had a stuntman that was on a descender, which is a, a, a cable drop. I could have done it with Andre if I really wanted to, because he could do it, but he, there's no use, because then if you're tight on him and seeing him, then you're not going to see the stunt. You want to see geography and all that. Mike Pyle's character is a soldier named Kevin Burke. It's a chance for us to see a guy who is not able to rely purely on brute force, so he's having to rely on some other kinds of skills and smarts to accomplish his goal. And he ends up becoming a very important character as the movie goes on. That's the cooling tower. If we can get in those pipes, we can access the reactor there. It's probably been capped off after the accident, but it can be reopened, sir. Acting is easy compared to you know, what I do for a living as a mixed martial artist. It's uh, a lot of pressure. You know, building up to the fight, getting ready for the fight. In the back of the locker room, nerves are going crazy. Mike Pyle is a professional mixed martial arts fighter. Action, Mike! I've never acted before. We actually cast him just from watching some interviews with him on the internet. We wanted this guy to be a very believable, tough American soldier, and Mike just seems exactly like that. The fact that he's a fighter means that physically he's able to do a lot of things stunt-wise in this film that normally you'd have to double an actor for. They're UFC fighters and they do their own stuff, so I, I use them for all their own fights. Unless you got something where they may get hurt. Not that they can't do it, but you have to use your safety precautions and know your limitations with actors, and Mike happens to be doing a pretty good part. So you don't want to get him hurt in his head or something like that, or sprain an ankle. So you put him in, in the things that you know he's, he can do. There's a lot of fights in the movie, you know, a lot of stunt work, and so you kind of have to come up with a character or an idea for each one. So this one, the meeting of Luke and Scott again, I kind of wanted it to be two bulls in a china shop rather than be spread apart, like some of our later fights, which involve more wide open spaces. This one is more about having them compact and not only banging into each other, but banging into everything around them. We rehearsed our fight scene that I have with Jean-Claude. We rehearsed for a week. It's a long scene, and it's sort of different than some other fight scenes because it has to do with power a lot. We go through a lot of walls, and there's a lot of high falls, and we kind of locked in this, like two bull terriers locked in this death struggle together. Action! Working with the Bulgarian stunt crew, they're just a very courageous group of guys who really throw themselves into it. There have been instances where he said, okay, you go in there and, and you should just be kind of pounding on this guy like you're fighting and you expect two people to be doing movie fighting, but they just go in there and start pounding the crap out of each other. First of all, there's tremendous professionalism in these guys who know exactly how to do this. They go flying out of this window, they break through the window, the glass, the frame, holding on to each other, they disengage, and they both land safely, and they get up and they do it again. Go, stunt guys, thank you. Perfect. Troy, that stunt guy, he got his head smashed into the cabinet. He went through a window, went through two walls, went through this window. Uh, they went over a banister down on stairs, so they, they banged into a lot of things. They're tough guys. Sometimes I think they're crazy, and other times I just marvel at how skilled they are. And it's probably a little of both. You've got to be a little crazy. I think most good stunt guys would admit to be really good at this. You know, set yourself on fire, jump out of a building, run a car into a wall at 50 miles an hour. Troy! You all right, Troy? Troy, you all right? At the same time, 
you know, the cowboy days of stunt work in Hollywood are long gone. It's now a very precise, specific science. Neil, here we go. Three, two, one, camera, action! We just did our uh, big uh, JC you know, storming the uh, rubble compound. And we have a steady cam on top on the front of the ATV with uh, several uh, explosions, a lot of gunfire. Fortunately, uh, a couple of the uh, mortars did not go off, so special effects is now uh, resetting the mortars. And also, after reviewing the footage, the uh, director and uh, DP have decided to add some a uh, little bit more action. So we'll probably be doing another two takes of this. The film really is a kind of rebirth of the whole concept of Universal Soldier. It has a toughness, almost a savagery about it that certainly is unlike the first two. In this film, my general approach from the get-go was let's present this as reality, less as high-tech sci-fi and more a cold kind of medical and scientific aesthetic. Everything being that function dictates form. It was not designed to kind of look in an aesthetically pleasing way. It was designed to make it look as if it actually functioned. As an example, like the sarcophagus coolers that the Universal Soldiers are contained in and kind of kept in suspended animation. Production designer Philip Harrison's concept, which I loved and went right along with what I was thinking, was that they should really look like these insulated tombs rather than a, a sleek stainless steel pod that opens up. We both realized it would have been an unhappy marriage of, uh, you know, silver painted um, sliding doors and things of that sort. I have to match these incredible paint finishes here and there, which you see on this decaying steelwork everywhere lying around. And it's not so easy to do, you know, that's the sort of thing that I do here, which is hidden really in the film, although it's there. And we, here in Bulgaria, we found these perfect matches for that type of thing that really the design was just picking the best spots possible and making them work, which wasn't too difficult. Well, this location here, and I'll say the word, I, I've been here for, for 10 weeks and I think I finally got it right. I think it's Kimikovsky. Very sad, there's a kind of a human story behind it of the thousands of people who worked here who no longer, you know, it's no more. Uh, they happen to be making steel the wrong way, unecological, a non-green way, so I guess that's the end of that. But the look is just astounding for us. What had to be done was to overlay a certain amount of modernity in the sense of some American or and co-Russian military gear. The whole concept of Chernobyl, the steel plant that we're using, an abandoned steel plant as our main reactor, is just this incredibly gothic kind of horror movie haunted house of a location that you could never in a million years create what we have with that. This is a location where it's impossible to point a camera at a boring looking thing. It's just the most remarkable sculpture, both in terms of size and shape and the shadow and light, and it's both intimidating and in a very strange way, it's quite beautiful. This area that we're using right here, which was a, um, at one time, I believe, a military school, uh, provides us with this abandoned city where we have free reign of all these buildings and areas and roads and whatnot. The first exterior day, it dumped snow, which on one hand was exactly what I wanted because I wanted a kind of snow-covered landscape for the film, but that's been a continuous challenge to try to continue having the snow. And just last night, actually, we were filming with foam as our snow and the wind kicked up and it was basically kicking up football-sized globs of foam in the air. John is a painter. Mm -hmm. John is a filmmaker who has a very, very specific idea of what he wants. He has a very specific idea of how he wants things to look. My charter is to get John what he sees, not what I see. John spent a couple of months showing me stills and pieces of film and even 
drawings and paintings of what he wanted the light to look like, what he wanted the palette to look like. So he was very specific about how he wanted things to look. Peter, who has shot all of his own movies for the last 30 years, has never shot anyone else's movies. This is the first time he's ever been a director of photography for another director. Um, and of course, it's his son. So sometimes they argue. It's great when they argue and they said, but son, that I tell you, I'm doing this take, and that's what I want, and that's it. Okay, so it's nice to see the two different type of generation. Peter has a lot of experience and John has a great vision of the picture and what he wants to do, something new and fresh uh, to, to reinvent the franchise. So I think it's a great idea. We've worked a lot in the past, always me working for him from the time I was a very young kid until as recently as last year, there's very few times where I outright disagree with him. But there are also the times where I have an idea and as he always tells me, listen, go with your idea, you know, fail with your own ideas, not what someone else told you to do. And so I follow his advice on that. And so sometimes I'll say, you know what, let's try this. It might be the wrong thing, but this is the idea in my head. And he says, all right, let's do that. John has got a vision that I really like he moves the camera. He likes those subjective point of views and he likes tying in the act he's shooting, seeing the actor, seeing a guy getting hit. He's moving the camera constantly. And that's his whole vision with the action. John Hames for me is the, uh, the junction uh, between the new way, young way of doing new action and at the same time the old school with uh, his amazing experience. So it was this clash between these two. He's a very, very modern, very unique he, way of seeing things. He did this absolutely brilliant documentary about mixed martial arts and ultimate fighting. So he's really plugged into that psyche and that kind of combat and that world. You know, John being the director, he said it as well. Take it into your hands, guys. And if he sees something that's not looking good enough for the camera, he'll tweak it for us. But I think he's relying a little bit on our know-how. Well, I try to sort of uh, do what I can to help the picture, and if I have any, any advice that I think impacts on my character, and I will make a suggestion perhaps to the director, and then it's up to him. He's the boss, and it's up to him to say yes or no. For me, I'm coming to these characters later than they are, but that's just fine. They're very welcoming of my ideas that are maybe different than some of the original ideas, because you're trying to take every movie into a direction that is consistent with the context of the times or the filmmaking styles of the times or what you're trying to say with it. So we're trying to say some different things with this, uh, you know, hopefully put a, some old characters into a contemporary uh, context.